Alrighty, so earlier I previewed the Eastern Conference first round match. Now we're going to do the Western Conference version and preview these four games that's going to be happening as the best of three of the Western Conference first round match. And what a way to start by talking about the most anticipated game in the first round of the playoffs this season. It's St. Louis City versus Sporting KC. And obviously, everyone want to thank the San Jose Earthquakes for their service of being a sacrifice. So that we got to make sure that this rivalry that even though it doesn't have a name yet, it, it, it's definitely grown into one of the hottest and spicy rivalry uh, in MLS. And yeah, they're going to be meeting each other for the first time in the playoffs. And who would have thought that for St. Louis City, their first ever playoff match in their expansion season would be against their most hated rival. And in some way, I would like to say that this is probably, you know, as much as I know St. Louis fans are going to be looking forward to facing against their rival, and it would definitely be a great feeling if they can knock them off in their first ever playoff series. you got to say, some of them are probably not, not excited to see Sporting KC, especially with the way that Sporting KC has been red hot lately coming into this game. Uh, now, in terms of the all-time meeting in this rivalry, it's still 2-0-1 in favor of St. Louis City. So far, the home team pretty much have won all of the meeting. Uh, St. Louis win 4-1 against Sporting KC. Sporting KC won 2-1 against St. Louis. And then St. Louis winning 4-0 against Sporting KC. Now, looking at the last five games for both of these teams, obviously, you know, for St. Louis, you know, they haven't been playing relatively well lately. And I'm not sure that's partially due to Bradley Carnell decided to rest some of his, his guys or there maybe should be some concern because, you know, the last two games, they lost both of them. They lost 2-0 to Seattle and then they lost 3-0 on the road against Vancouver. They did win 4-1 against Sporting KC and that's the last time that both of these teams met. And then they won 2-1 on the road against Minnesota and then draw 0-0 against Houston. Uh, for Sporting KC, uh, what we saw on Wednesday, they were able to grind out a 4-2 PK shootout win against the San Jose Earthquakes before winning 3-1 against Minnesota, uh, winning 3-2 against RSL, winning 4-1 uh, against, or actually losing 4-1 to St. Louis City, and then winning 2-1 against the Houston Dynamo. So besides the St. Louis Resort, Sporting KC have pretty much won every single game out of that, and that it seems like this is kind of the, the Peter Vermee Sporting KC side that we fought that day. It was going to be, especially with them getting much more healthier and pretty much all their attacking uh, weapons in fact in, in line in, in this game. Uh, top goal scored for St. Louis. Uh, obviously, Joe Klaus leads the team with 10 goals, but same with Nicholas Giacchini. You know, two guys that has really been been uh, uh, a number nine that, that St. Louis has been really hoping to, to be uh, scoring during the double-digit goals here. Obviously, Giacchini got a lot of those goals because, you know, he was the starter for the this team before Joe Claus went down with an injury. Then you got Samuel Adanaran with eight uh, goals, followed by Edouard Lubin with six goals, and Jared Stroud with five goals. For Sporting KC, Alan Polito leads the team with 14 goals, followed by Johnny Russell with eight goals, and Daniel Shara with, with seven goals. Again, not a big surprise because that's the big three of Sporting KC. Then you got Eric Tommy with five goals and William Magada with three goals. Now, top assist leader for St. Louis, unsurprisingly, it's Edouard Lubin, probably one of the most underrated playmaker in the, the league with 14 assists, followed by Jared Strout, Indiana Vasta with five assists, and then Rasmus Um and Joel Claus rounds up the top five with four assists. For Sporting KC, Eric Tommy leads the team with 11 assists. Another guy that is very underrated in terms of playmaking. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that both of those guys are more like deep line playmaker rather than number 10s. But uh, in second, we got Daniel Sherry with nine assists, Gotti Kinio with four assists, Remy Voltaire with four assists, and Tim Leibo finished with three assists to round up the top five for Sporting KC. So again, it should be a very interesting matchup. I mean, I feel. Like, like whenever we see a game that it's it's a, a rivalry ma matchup, you know, you can talk about all the forms you, you like from recent team, and you can talk about uh, whether if it's a favorable matchup for either of these teams or not. You know both of these teams would want to win. And, and with that being said, I'm pretty sure both of these teams is going to give it them all. But obviously, I think, think you got to say that Sporting KC is going to have the advantage here, mainly because, you know, they have players that have been in this situation before they know how to deal with it. Whereas for St. Louis, this is the first ever game. And, you know, while it's great to play in front of your home fans and, you know, that atmosphere at City Park, even though it's going to be a late kickoff, that one, you know it's going to be bouncing at City Park in that one. And while that could, could definitely create an atmosphere to, to will this St. Louis team to get a victory, 
it can also be be to a point where you might put pressure on the St. Louis City side. I mean, I, I know that coming into this pl playoff, St. Louis City has nothing to lose. Like they are basically playing house m money even for a number one seed. Uh, but you got to say that maybe there are that pre pressure in terms of the fact that yeah, you made it the, to the playoffs. But here's the thing: you got to face against your your most hated rival, and it would definitely sting for the for them and certainly their fans if they do do lose to their most hated rival in their first for a playoff appearance. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how that's going to go and whether you know the pressure of being the top top seed is gonna get to uh, St. Louis and the inexperience of of not never being in the playoffs could be an advantage for Sporting KC because Sporting KC has been in the playoffs for a long time and a lot of these guys definitely have those playoff experience. Then we move on to the next matchup, which is the Seattle Sounders versus FC Dallas. So uh, this is a matchup that I'm pretty sure a lot of people are saying it's probably going to be, be one-sided because, you know, Seattle, they are looking like following the script that we, we've seen before with them winning MLS Cup under Brian Schmitzer. Tends to be terrible in the first half of the season, and then the second half of the season come, and this is where they start that resurgence. And because of that, uh, they come into this game with a nine-game unbeaten run against an FC uh, Dallas side that you know just was able to limp into the playoffs. And in terms of all-time meeting, 18, 12, and 10 in favor of Seattle. But in terms of the two head-to-head -head meeting this season, it was one-one draw for both of these these team in both their meetings. Now, in terms of the last five games, uh, of course, Seattle won 2-0 against St. Louis. They had a 0-0 draw against Vancouver. But then they win 2-1 against the Galaxy before another 0-0 draw, and then winning 2-1 against the Colorado Rapids. I mean, you know, these games that Seattle has won hasn't been pretty whatsoever. Hasn't been what you thought a, a Seattle Sounders team would be uh, in, in the past. But, you know, no, I'm pretty sure Brian Smith and this team don't care how how resort goes as long as they get on the on the winning chart then they 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 will be happy and that's a good mentality to have especially when you're in in the the playoffs to, at a point where you know you're not going to get a lot of chances or there's going to be a lot of low scoring games and if you're able to win those low scoring games and you are able to make it to the next round. Uh, whereas for Dallas, uh, they did win 4-1 against the Galaxy. That was the, the game that where their offense finally broke down and really one of the few times that they have broke down this season because besides that, it was a 1-1 draw against Colorado, a 1-1 draw against San Jose, a 0-0 draw against Houston, and then a 1-1 draw against the Philadelphia Union. Now, top goal scored for the Seattle Sounders. You got Jordan Morris with 11 goals, followed by Leo True, uh, Raul Root, Diaz, Albert Rusnak with five goals, and then Christian Rodon uh, rounds up the top five with three goals. For Dallas, you got Jesus Ferreira with 12 goals, followed by um, Camungo, Winar Camungo, can't speak for for a second there, with six goals there. Um, then you got Hunter Obreon with, with six goals, Alan Velasco with four goals, and then to finish off, Cozy Tafari with three goals to rounds up the top five goal scored for uh, FC Dow. So again, when you look at both of the, these teams, both of these teams are kind of similar in in a way where you know they're not a team that that's gonna wow you on on the attack, and they're not a team in terms of scoring tons of goals. Which is why I also feel like as much as people say that this is gonna be be one sided affair, maybe not. I mean, when you look at both of these teams kind of playing tight games, I feel like this could be one of those games where it could be be incredibly. I, and can be very similar to what I said about the Philadelphia Union versus New England uh, in my last video talking about a game that could be a little bit tight. And if you are a, a, a fan of goals and a lot of action, then maybe you should stay away from this game because this is probably going to be a slug fest and there's not going to be a lot of goals and a lot of action that's going to happen. Now, in terms of the top assist leader, uh, Nico Ladero, who this could be potentially the final run for, for him because if there has been reports saying that he is going to be leaving the Seattle Sounders this, this fall season. Uh, he, he leads the team with 10 assists, followed by Leo True with 8 assists, Shaw Paulo with 5 assists, Jackson Reagan with 4 assists, and then Alex Rodon with 4 assists. Interesting, the fact that uh, their last two player but are one full fullback and the other one a center back. So yeah, you don't see that happen all, often. Seeing one one of the the, the the top assist leader, especially two of the top assist leader, tends to be playing on the defensive position. Then you got for Dallas, you got Jesus Ferreira with six assists, uh, Hader Obreon with five assists, Paul Ariola with four assists, uh, Cozy Tafari with four assists, and Ensemblin with four assists for this FC Dallas team. Again, 
I expect this this should be very very tight, and that you know, because of the fact that we have a game that is very tight, you know, I I kind of feel like like maybe this not only might not be one sided, but maybe it could be be unpredictable. I mean, I know the narrative and the the script say that Seattle is probably gonna win because you know the 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 the, the general rule is whenever uh, FC Dallas play against a Cascadia team, it's pretty much season set a match for them because it's like a curse for them. They, they cannot beat Cascadia team. But still, you know, as the old saying goes, all script, scripts and all, all curse eventually is going to have to come to an end. And maybe this could be the year for, for Dallas to end, end that, that curse, especially against the Seattle team that, you know, while they are definitely uh, playing much better uh, lately getting resort, they, they still haven't really been like like the Seattle Sounders that I've I've seen under Brent French Mets of four years ago, that free-flowing kind of team. But at the same time, you could also argue that they don't have to be because as long as they're winning games, then they're they're like the old Seattle Sounders having that second-half research and, and ready to, to once again frustrate every single team in the Western Conference of once again representing the, the West and make it to MLS Cup. I mean, I'm pretty sure if there is the last team that they out of the West that every fan fan in MLS want to see to make it out to MLS Cup, uh, probably LAFC, and then you got the, the Seattle Sounders. Actually, I would say Seattle probably is at first because, you know, uh, LAFC. Actually, both of them are pretty, pretty close, but I would still say the Seattle Sounder is the case because at least, at least LAFC did finally break that that um that that rule with the fact that we always see a Cascadia team make it to MLS Cup going all the way back to 2014. But yeah, LAFC. Uh, they play against the Vancouver Whitecaps. So again, I said this before about this matchup being a matchup that's been been happening a lot this season. In fact, uh, out of all the playoff matchups, this is the matchup that has the most matchup uh in during the 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 season, both in the regular season and also uh in the Concacaf Champions League. And here we are again between both of these teams. Uh, LAFC of course leads the all time meeting six four and five and. In terms of this season head to head again, there's been four matchups that has ha happened, and the last two has actually been in favor favored of the Vancouver Whitecaps. I mean, they did get a one one draw on decision day against LAFC in a game where I thought they were the better team in that one, and, and probably should have won if they didn't miss the, those penalty from Ryan Gall. And then they went on the road and win three two against LAFC to get their first uh, win off the road this season. Now, obviously, in the CONCACAF Champions League, this is where the Vancouver Whitecaps fans will say, let's not talk about that, because uh, they lost both legs in the CONCACAF Champions League, and both of them were free nothing uh, losses. Now, in terms of the last five games for LAFC, it was a 1-1 one, one, one draw against Vancouver before winning 4-2 against Austin. Then they won 5-1 against Minnesota, and then before that, this is when they had that goal drought. Uh, they... They uh, lost one nothing to RSL and then drew nil nil against the Philadelphia Union for Vancouver. I already mentioned the one one draw that they had against LAFC, but before that it was a nil nil draw against the Vancouver Whitecaps. They did win three nothing against St. Louis, drew two two against DC, and then drew two two against the Colorado Rapids. And I gotta say, you know, Benny Sertini, they, they haven't really looked that that good uh, lately ever since that that incredible run that they had to start the the seven game brutal road trip, but it's still good enough for them to get into this posi position. And again, against a, a familiar team like LAFC, you know that Vanny Sertini will be licking his chop and thinking that, hey, you know, we beat them already before in the regular s season. And besides what happened in CCO, which, you know, back then Vancouver was a complete different team than where they are right now. They still have a shot in this one. Now, in terms of the top goal score, we got the Golden Boot winner, Denise Mwanga, with 20 goals, followed by Carlos Vela with 9 goals. They got Ryan Hollingshead with 4 goals, T Timothy Tillman with 4 goals, and then Steve A. Few rounds up the top 5 with 3 goals for LAFC. For the Whitecaps, you got Brian White with 15 goals, followed by Ryan Gall with 11 goals, Simon Betcher with 4 goals, Petro Vite also with 4 goals, and then round out your top 5. Oh, actually, I should write a different player because Julian Gresso technically is no longer a uh, Vancouver Whitecaps player. I haven't included... Uh, former player uh, on on this list yet yet mainly because you know they don't play for for the team anymore. Julian Gresso is now with the Columbus Crew. Now top assist leader for uh, LAFC, you got Carlos Vela leads being the team with 12 assists, despite the fact that a lot of people have saw him him completely washed up. I think mainly due to the fact that he's not scoring the the goals. I mean he still is is a prolific playmaker. Well, obviously I'm pretty sure people are still expecting him to be the guy that that scored the goals for this team and he simply just haven't haven't done that 
Uh, then, then we got Denise Bowanga with seven assists. Um, Teos Bogush with four assists. Ilya Sanchez with three assists. And then Junio Chiellini actually made the list of the top five assists leader with two assists for LAFC. For Vancouver, unsurprisingly, it's Ryan Gall with 12 assists, Brian White with 6 assists, then you got Andres Kubas with 3 assists, Richie Larea with 3 assists, and Petro, Petro Vite also with 3 assists for the Vancouver Whitecaps. So, again, you know, there could be, be a, a case where we could see 7 matchups this season between LAFC and the Vancouver Whitecaps. And, you know, I know this might not sound like a, a rivalry, but I feel like with the way that this is the fifth time that both of these teams have seen against each other, you know that both of these teams are going to start to get a little irritated facing off against each other. And don't be surprised, there could be some some bad blood, especially if this game does share some bad blood. That could continue into game two or even game three if they're necessary to be. Because, again, when you face against the same team for so many, many times, especially knowing that this is going to be the second time you're facing against the same team, team you just faced in Decision Day, I expect there, there could be some some bad blood if that is the case. But one thing I, I know for sure is that don't be surprised if the Vancouver Whitecaps can knock off uh, LAFC. I mean, I know LAFC started to get their acts together. I'm pretty sure they did not want to see the Vancouver Whitecaps consider this is a team, especially when they play against them at BC C plays. And especially from what we saw on decision day, yeah, that was that that is a game game where where um again I said the Whitecaps should have won it if the Crying Goal converts even one of his two penalty that that he missed, and that I think this should be a very closely matchup, and and we will not be surprised that there's going to be a seventh matchup this season between both of these teams. And then finally, we got the Houston Dynamo versus RSL. I forgot to write the the seeding there, but this of course is the four v five seed, and this is also a very familiar matchup because you know this is a matchup we saw in the U.S. Open Cup set. Semi-final, and yeah, RSL fans would not want to remember that. In fact, that whole week between the U.S. Open Cup semi-final and then leading up to the weekend game where both of these teams face off against each other, uh, RSL fans would not want to remember because besides Houston getting a 14, 11, and 13 advantage over RSL, uh, after Houston knocked out RSL and then was able to get to the final of the U.S. Open Cup against Inter Miami with a 3-1 win, they followed that by going on the road and win 3 nothing against RSL. But before that, it was kind of a stale nil-nil draw, which, you know, this happened in the beginning of the season, which it always seems like whenever Houston and RSL play in the beginning of the season, it always ends in a dull nil-nil draw. Now, in the last five games for Houston, I talked about Orlando being one of the hottest teams in the league. You can add Houston onto that list, too, because they won 3-1 on the road against Portland and 5-1 against the Colorado Rapids. They did drew 1-1 against Montreal, drew nil-nil against Dallas. But then in the U.S. Open Cup final, really against all odds and against uh, the script writer, they won 2-1 against Inter Miami to lift their second U.S. Open Cup trophy in their franchise history. For RSL, uh, they did win 1-0 against Colorado, but before that it was a 2-2 draw against the Galaxy, a 3-2 loss to Sporting KC, a 1-0 win against LAFC, and then a 2-1 win against the Vancouver Whitecaps. So I, I would say that, you know, for RSL, they have started to to play a little bit better compared to what we saw back in August where it was just an absolute free fall that they were, were going going through. But now it's kind of like they're in a stage where, you know, they're, they're still not good, but at least they're not, not in a complete free fall. It looked like they're going to miss out on the, the playoffs at, as that was one point, a, a strong possibility for this Real Salt Lake team. In terms of the top goal scored for Houston, uh, I'm not... Me, Bossy actually leads the team with 10 goals, but again, a lot of that probably came from, from the spot because he was the man, main penalty taker, and Houston won a lot of penalty kick this season. Uh, then you got Corey Bear with 8 goals, Hector Herrera with 4 goals, Nelson Quinones with 4 goals, and then Coco Kiercia, who I'm surprised he only had 3 uh, goals this season, despite the fact that he, he's been absolutely electric this season. Then uh, for RSL, you got Jefferson Savarino with seven goals, followed by Chicharago with six goals. Then you got Justin Glad, yeah, the, the the center back with five goals. You usually don't see that happen often, being a, a center back that high in terms of goal scoring list. But again, goal scoring was a problem for this RSL team at time this season. Then you got Anderson Julio with five goals, and then Diego Luna, who scored the only goal against Colorado on decision day, uh, get his tallies to five goals to round up the top five goal scoring. Uh, top assist leader for the Houston Dynamo, you got Hector Herrera. Uh, actually finished second in the list in terms of 
uh, assist leader in MLS with 17 assists, followed by Coco Carrasquilla with 8 assists, Corey Bear with 6 assists, Amani um, Bossi with 4 assists, and then uh, Ivan Franco finish with 3 uh, assists for this Houston side. For RSL, you got uh, Andres Gomez with 6 assists, followed by Pablo Ruiz with 6 assists, uh, you have a seven nil, same number, six assists. Then you got two guys tied with four assists with Andrew Brody and Michael Chan tied with four assists for this Real Salt Lake team. So, yeah, again, should be an interesting kind of battle. Again, Houston is that definitely a dark horse team. They're a team that I think could definitely make some noise. But, you know, uh, me, me using the word dark horses seems to put a curse on, on teams because I, I've said this before, a, a team that could be a dark horse heading in to the playoffs, and yeah, they don't usually do very, very well. I mean, I called Montreal a dark horse. I mean, they did win a game at, at least, but then they, they lost in the conference semifinal, and then I think I called Vancouver a dark horse uh, back in 2021. They lost to Sporting KC in the first round, and then I, I called Colorado was a dark horse uh, back in the COVID short season, and they lost in the first round. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Houston fans, um, label them a as a dark horse, uh, especially if that means that they're probably going to get knocked out in the first round of, of the playoffs. But still, this should be a very interesting matchup, and you know RSL won revenge after what happened uh, in the U.S. Open Cup semifinal, especially uh, in general what happened that week. That was just such a, a horrendous week for RSL, probably the lowest point that they, they had, not only getting knocked out of a competition that they haven't gone very for uh lately in the u.s open cup but finally had a chance to to win the whole thing and then it, it snatched them away and that to make make things fast to add insult to injury the same team that knocked them out would come come into their home and basically they uh put almost a, a similar beating that they had uh in the u.s open cup sem semi-final match just a couple of days ago there you have it. That is pretty much it in terms of looking at all of these first round matchup in the Western Conference. As always, let me know in the comments below what do you think of these games. And let me also know in the comments below what's your prediction in terms of all four of these best of three series game. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys like, smash the subscribe button. And yeah, I of course will see you guys next time.